So they're trying to scare everyone and make it clear that you cannot say what you think. At the same time, many Russians, mostly the young, are fleeing their native country, scared away by new punishments, fines and sentences for speaking out against the regime. And with the access to social media now limited, if not increasingly non-existent, what is actually the impact of this war on Russian culture and the perception of Russia, both from without and from within? Uh, I'm joined to discuss this by Elena Sudakeva, who's the executive director of Pushkin House, the UK's oldest independent Russian cultural centre based here in London, and by food writer and social historian Anna. We won't give her surname for reasons that uh, will be very clear, who until a few weeks ago lived and worked in Moscow, but joins us now from Turkey. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Anna, Good perhaps evening. if we could just start with you, um, and if you could just explain your story, I suppose, why you're talking to us from Turkey um, and not from Moscow, where you live or lived. Well, I left Moscow um, two weeks ago today. Uh, when the war started on the first day, I went to the protest and um, I gave an interview to a Western media that was quite, quite explicit. And um, I've been quite active on, on social media. And at first, I wasn't scared of doing any of that. It seemed quite normal. But um, after they introduced the law of um, treason, punishing people for um, showing any support to Ukraine, and then the law of fake news, which can get you up to 15 years in jail, which is um, sharing any news about what is actually happening in Ukraine. And uh, I realized that it was only a matter of time before they started mass purges and um, I just I got scared and I packed up my bags and my husband and son and I uh, fled basically within 24 hours of deciding to actually go. You mentioned that new law. I mean, um, there's been in the news this week the story of 51-year-old Nika, and forgive me if I... Belet, uh, you say you, her surname, I'm going to pronounce all wrong. Um, but she's a popular Russian food blogger who has now become one of the first charged under this fake news laws. Um, she's in south of France. She's been threatened with up to 15 years in prison. So you have escaped. Do, do you still feel nervous about those sorts of things? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm quite terrified um, for all of my friends, for my family back in Russia. And um, Bilanika, you know, as she, she goes by the food uh, blogger and cookbook author, they just picked her as, as the first media person, but they've also sentenced uh, two people who aren't even known to any, anyone, um, two people in Tomsk, one woman is a pensioner and she has a Telegram account with 170 followers and she was sharing anti-war stuff. And then there was another person who was just walking along when the protest was happening, anti-war anti protest. And they said that he silenced, that his silence supported the protest. So they're trying to scare everyone and make it clear that you cannot say what you think. Uh, Elena, you you uh, are in charge of Pushkin House, which has been openly critical of the war, but it's been critical of Putin, I think, ever since uh, for a very long time. I mean, do, do you feel any new sense of nerves at taking such a stance now? Well, I mean, um, probably, um, but I would just like to say that, you know, obviously this is a huge tragedy for Ukrainians, but it's also a different kind of tragedy for Russians uh, who didn't choose this war and, you know, who are now experiencing alienation from the rest of the world, you know, whether they're in the UK or in Russia. And you mentioned the, the, the sort of cultural boycotts. And uh, over the course of last weeks, uh, we witnessed talks of cultural boycotts turning into actions, unfortunately. We see that loans are withdrawn, um, museum exchanges are paused, exhibitions are cancelled, uh, but boycotts only work and are only meaningful when those initiating boycotts are also heard by them, when withdrawing participation comes with the costs. 
And I think that boycotts driven by the sanctions, I'm sorry, I feel that they only sort of play into the rhetoric uh, of Cold War. And there are so many critically thinking, independent creatives, academics, and intellectuals in Russia uh, who have an urgent need for a dialogue and an urgent need to be heard. And, uh, you know, these boycotts will only isolate them further. And, um, you know, as, as individuals, as, as an organization, we really uh, want to keep all communications channels open to the best of our abilities. And we feel that di dialogues and engagement is very important right now. Have you actively had to cancel, postpone uh, things that you had planned on your schedule? We, we, we did refocus our programming. Yes, we postponed our programming, but we refocused it in order to support uh, Ukrainian schools. We're giving voices to uh, Ukrainian creatives at the moment. Uh, we're fundraising for different charity causes, and uh, this will continue. But we are aware, of course, that Russians uh, who are you know, in exile also need platform. So we have a, a program uh, planning ahead on that. Anna, we heard your story. You've left, and as I understand it, you've left your mother. Uh, I think she's looking after your dog, and I'm sorry you couldn't take your dog with you, and your grandparents back in Moscow. Lots of people are talking at the moment about there being a, a big intergenerational split, that um, the young and the old have very different ideas of what's going on and very different thoughts at this stage. Is that what you're seeing? Is that what you were seeing? I've certainly seen a lot of Facebook posts about it, uh, people saying that um, they've just spoken to their parents and they completely don't understand and they're brainwashed and they can't get through to their parents. And uh, people of my age um, will often be left just in tears trying to understand how they can get through to their parents. So that's def definitely happening. Not in my family, but, but I have seen it happen. Mm. But it might be, if I can just add, also partly technological gap, uh, because people who are getting their news from the, you know, state, uh, from TV, which is state propaganda channels, are obviously not informed compared to those who are using social media and who have access to alternative sources of information. And that's what I was going to ask, and it's so interesting. People. Um... Eleanor, perhaps stay with you. I, I, I have heard people say and describe Russia as split into TV Russia and Internet Russia. Yes, well, th I would say that is uh, partly the case. Um, I mean, but also, I mean, it's very, you know, as you've already said, you know, Facebook is banned, Instagram is banned. There are news circulating today that uh, WhatsApp and YouTube will also be probably banned by the end of next week. So where do people, you know, and people were used to watching TV, they didn't have any other access. So that's, um, that, that's part of the problem, I feel. But, but Anna, where, where do people get their information? Where is communication happening if all of those channels are being closed down? I mean, I know you're, um, you and others are still certainly using Instagram. Um, well, lots of people, young people are downloading VPNs and uh, are still able to access Instagram and Facebook and will continue to use them. Although I know that the state is trying to block VPN services as well, but I don't think they'll be able to stay on top of all of them. So those who are seeking the news, those who are used to um, Instagram and Facebook will continue most likely to do that. But there's also Telegram. Um, Telegram is very popular in Russia. There are lots of Telegram channels. Uh, I follow um, Meduza, you know, Dorst, TV Rain, and there's still uh, there's still a lot of information there. And uh, I have screenshotted uh, articles and sent them on to my mom because she hasn't got VPN yet, and and she said that she has forwarded them on to a bunch of people as well. So, Guys, so kind of going Soviet style. Yeah, well. So interesting how you are finding ways to get the information um, that you want to uh, across. But Eleanor, if we could uh, come back to you, I, I know that one of the things people find uh, most sad about all of this is, of course, that uh, Russian and Ukrainian culture are so interlinked. Uh, I think you um, sort of symbolize that in your life. You uh, um, your children were educated in Ukraine, as I understand it, and you grew up in Russia. 
yourself? Well, yes, yes. My my, I, I lived in Ukraine for several years, and my two elder kids first went to school there. Uh, and I mean, we 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 share common history. You know, we definitely for sure uh, share common uh, Soviet past. Um, at least half of Ukrainians, maybe even more, speak Russian. I mean, we understand each other's mentality and each other's way of thinking. I mean, I'm sure you know we even share the same food recipes. And this is exactly why this war is so absolutely impossible and so, you know, horrendous. But of course, we're different nations. I mean, we're different peoples. Do you, do you think that um, this is uh, clearly going to be driving that apart? Those friendships and those um, and those shared values and bonds. Well, at the moment, of course, I mean, when, when people are being bombed, it's 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 only on, you know their feelings and their emotions are are fully understandable. I hope that there will be, you know, you know, later when we examine why this happened and, and how it came about and how this, this tragedy unveiled and what led to it. Uh, I hope that the dialogue will still be possible. And that's my sincere wish. Mm. And we, I will be working, you know, in all directions to make that happen personally. Yeah. Uh, Anna, um, I wonder if you know I, you can understand the fact that some Russians say, you, "Wonderful, you you know you are protesting now," but to them, they blame Russians for not speaking out sooner, protesting sooner, and feel now is too little, too late. Well, we're all wondering what we we could have done. Uh, not just wondering, we're we're absolutely devastated, and we, we feel terrible. In so many ways, um, you know, we're devastated for Ukraine, you know, absolutely heartbroken. We see Russia um, just be plunged into the sort of darkness that we couldn't imagine. And it breaks my heart that uh, Russia isn't what it was on the 23rd. And at the same time, we also have this guilt and this feeling of what could I have done differently? But I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. And I... I've always gone to protests, uh, you know, for as long as I can remember myself. But obviously, it wasn't enough. I don't know. It's 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 kind of a lot to bear. Will you go back? Not in this. Not under this regime. So, you, are you going to stay in Turkey, or what is your plan? I'm waiting for my uh, Australian visa because my husband is Australian, and we're going to go there. Okay. Uh, Eleanor, you said before um, I, I, that you were going to do everything you could um, in your role at Pushkin House to ensure that the cultural bonds um, stick. Uh, do you think arts can play an important and significant role in these sorts of things, or is that wishful thinking? I, I do believe that art is at the moment the only instrument that we have to still maintain the dialogue. Uh, I do believe that we need to really engage because not engagement, you know, where would it lead us, this silence? Uh, but I think some, some things have to be sort of brought to the surface. I, I, I know that a lot of artists, Russian artists at the moment, you know, are initiating conferences and, you know, panel discussions uh, focused on decolonization of sort of Russian way of thinking. So there are many things that we would have to process, but I sincerely hope that that's the, the only way. Can you tell me a little bit about what you mean when you say, how, how does that work, this idea that you want to try and uh, decolonize Russia through art? Well, I mean, uh, for example, um, you know, it's true that in many cases, I mean, certainly during Soviet times, but also in the so post-Soviet times, many, for example, Soviet artistic accomplishments were seen as Russian only. And there are many reasons for it. And, you know, I don't want, want to go into all of them now, but it is very important now for sort of many Western critics to kind of change their post-colonial optics and approach. And it's very important for Russians to acknowledge that as well. For example, I curated an exhibition in 2017 together with an Ukrainian artist, Nikita Kadan, which was on this trajectory of decolonization. It explicitly used the term Ukrainian avant-garde as a response to the widely used term of Russian uh, avant-garde. 
Um, and also sort of, you know, we have to acknowledge that, for example, Ukrainian artistic trajectory didn't follow Russian one. Uh, there were very different movements, very different cultural influences. So uh, all of this really has to come to the surface. All of this deserves to be studied and all of this is yet to be unraveled. Anna, you're a social historian uh, as well, as well as a food writer. Um, I expect that all makes a lot, you know, rings true with you. But do you do you do you have the faith that Helena has that the, that we can change anything like that? Do you say you're not going to go back under this regime? Do you have any optimism, therefore, that you'll go back in the near future? Um, I mean, as as anyone who knows um, history at least a little bit, I know that every dark period comes to an end, and I know that this will end. It's just a matter of time. I don't know when. It's going to be over, but I know that I will go back to Russia to try and re rebuild what we lost. And everyone that I've met here in Istanbul says the same thing that uh, we know it's going to be hard to go back um, and rebuild, but we that's what we want to do because you know, I want to live in Russia. I want to live in Moscow. Uh, Eleanor, just perhaps to finish off, you could tell us some of the things that are going on at Pushkin House. I know you had a wonderful discussion um, with Alyssa uh, Tomashkina, who's coming up later on this programme, and Olia Hercules just this week. But perhaps you could give us a flavour of some of the yes. things. I, I know you've had to cancel and postpone uh, a lot, but perhaps you could give us a taste of some of the things that are coming up. So, so uh, just yesterday we had a film screening uh, with a great uh, Ukrainian filmmaker, uh, Nikola Ridny, uh, and uh, all the proceeds from that would go to support Ukrainian filmmakers. Um, today we're having um, uh, a concert, uh, a concert for peace by Russian musicians, and again, uh, all the proceeds will go to support a Ukrainian charitable cause. Uh, and we have many different, we have another concert planned uh, next week. The film screenings that we're uh, doing are now going to be on the regular basis. Uh, we're also, uh, you know, providing Pushkin House uh, as a platform uh, for uh, sort of social media takeovers for Ukrainian artists. We are um, publishing uh, some of the artist's diaries uh, in our newsletters. We're also giving platform to sort of repressed and not heard you know, Russian voices. Um, and uh, so this work will absolutely continue. Thank you both so much for joining. It's really absolutely fascinating to hear from you. And hopefully we can have you both back. We'll, no doubt this discussion um, can be picked up further down the line. Uh, Anna and Eleanor Sudakova, thank you so much for joining on Times Radio.